सो हेलो एवरी वन आवर टूडे टॉपिक इज ग्रोथ एंड डेवलपमेंट सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल यू शुड नो वट डू यू मीन बाय ग्रोथ ग्रोथ एज वी ऑल नो दैट ग्रोथ प्राइमरी रेफर्स टू इंक्रीज इन द साइज मास एंड फिजिकल डायमेंशन ऑफ एन ऑर्गेनिजम सो अकॉर्डिंग टू टोड ग्रोथ रेफर्स टू इंक्रीज इन साइज अकॉर्डिंग टू द प्रॉफिट इट्स इंक्रीज इन साइज एंड नंबर so these are all the definition of the growth well the growth remember uh, it can be measured and it is quantified so it involves the tracking physical parameters like individual height weight and size of the body organ whereas on other hand development development it is it refers to a broader range of changes it is not limited to the physical growth but it also includes the physiological and the behavior so it involves the physiological and behavior changes apart from the physical growth so development it is a qualitative term so development it is a progress toward the maturity so these all are the definition of the of the development so the development remember it is a holistic concept that take into account both the physiological and the uh, the physical and the functional aspect of the organism growth so that involves the progression from the initial state to a more mature or advanced state now the growth it can occur uh, Uh, remember the growth it is basically the anatomical phenomenon and it is quantitative in nature whereas development it is a physiological phenomena and it is qualitative in nature so this is the difference between the growth and the development now growth remember the growth it can it can occur at the cellular level uh, that can be cellular hyperplasia what do you mean by hyperplasia hyperplasia means increase when there is increase in the cell number it's known as hyperplasia so this type of growth it involves increase in the number of cell through the mitotic through the mitotic division so the, uh, it results in proliferation of cells leading to uh, leading to enlargement of the tissue or the organ so the cellular hyperplasia it is generally seen in respond to increase demand such as during the tissue repair or in response to the hormonal changes whereas the cellular hypertrophy hypertrophy when there is increase in the cell size suppose this one is the healthy cell or the normal cell when the size is increased the cell size is increase it is it is known as hypertrophy so increase in the size of individual cell without the cell division is the cellular hypertrophy the uh, the cellular hypertrophy it is seen in a more commonly seen in the muscle cells like response to exercise or weight lifting could be the example so these are the growth that can occur at the cellular level whereas the growth at the tissue level it can be of various type the first is acc accretionary growth uh that means that when there is increase in amount of extra cellular matrix we know extra extra cellular matrix it is found between the tissue cells so instead of change in the cell number or cell size there when there is when there is increase in amount of the extra cellular matrix between the tissue cell uh, uh like in the connective tissue uh that type of growth is excretionary growth other is the appositional growth appositional growth refers to addition of new cells and extracellular matrix to surface of the tissue so when there is addition of new cells and extracellular matrix to the surface of tissue uh, it can occur to through the repeated division of cells by interstitial cambial layer so this type of growth it is seen in tissue when there is continuous multiplication and creationary growth throughout the thickness of tissue mass the other growth pattern is the meristematic form 
it is it is absorbed in tissue that grow from a tip containing population of the dividing cells so the tip it moves distally that is away from the center it is most commonly seen in the plants especially in the growing tips or the roots and stems other is the compensatory growth when there is balance between the loss of tissue due to wear and tear and uh, and the maintenance of the functional tissue integrity so a balance occur between the loss of the tissue and the need to maintain functional tissue integrity so this type of growth it is important is uh, especially in the case of regeneration and repair of tissue like the renewable renewal of the skin cells after the injury now let us discuss the what are the factors that can affect growth and maturation number 1 is the genetic factor well the genetic factor it plays a fundamental role in determining the individual growth and maturation so variation in the genetic makeup can lead to differences in the growth rate and ultimate the adult height so these genetic factor remember these genetic factor can interact with the environmental influence that can uh, determine the final outcome other are the growth hormones and the growth factors growth hormones we know they are produced by the pituitary gland right so they have a important influence on the growth and maturation they will stimulate the growth of bones muscles and other tissue we know that the growth factors like the insulin like growth factors they play a role in promoting the cell growth and differentiation so imbalance in these hormones and factors they can lead to growth hormone deficiencies other is the nutrition nutrition we all know that proper nutrition it is vital for the healthy growth and maturation so adequate intake of essential nutrients uh, including the proteins vitamins minerals calories all these are necessary for the development of tissues organs and the bones so malnutrition can lead to stunting growth delayed maturation and various health problems secular trends uh, like changes uh, in the physical growth patterns and maturation these are known as the secular trends so these are influenced by the factors like improvement in nutrition and the health care chronic illness infections disease can have a effect on the growth and maturation prolonged illness will inhibit the growth by affecting nutrient absorption and the utilization uh, seasonal and circadian rhythm uh, well they can influence the growth and maturation uh, environmental factors like exposure to natural light temperature variation in the sleep pattern they can have a impact on the timing of the growth event like the puberty stress stress like trauma abuse chronic stress can impact the growth and maturation now what are the methods apart from that let us discuss the methods that we use for studying physical growth so two methods can be used one is the measurmental approach that can be measured and the experimental approach the measurmental approach involves measuring living animals including the humans whereas the experimental approach it uses experiment to manipulate the growth in the first is the craniometry uh, in the remember in the measurement approach uh, the various studies with the various methods we use are the craniometry anthrometry cephalometry and for experimental ap- approach vital staining radio isotopes audio auto radiography and implant radiography now what is a craniometry craniometry it involves the measurement of the human skull so a craniometer 
so this one is the craniometer that is used to measure the dimension of the human skull and face including those of fossils so it will it will uh, we can measure the diameter of the dimension of the human skull through the craniometer and the study is the uh, craniometry it is always cross sectional anthrometry anthrometry uh, it is technique in which skeleton dimensions they are measured on the living individuals so anthro anthropometry it is it can be used in the dry skull studies and both the dry skull and the living people so it allow for the longitudinal study of the growth whereas the craniometry it it uh, the uh, it allows the cross sectional study of the growth other is the cephalometric radiography uh, that requires a precise head position using a cephalostat so here we use cephalostat so remember it provides a two dimensional representation view of the of the structures so remember the craniometry deals with the dry skull and anthropometry means with the living individuals now the major experimental approach uh, we can use is the vital staining vital staining who uh, who introduced the vital staining it was john hunter remember this for your mcq now the technique is we inject dyes into animal to observe the pattern of the stained mineral mineralized tissue so uh, the dyes they are injected into animals and these dyes are absorbed by the bones and the teeth so these dyes will incorporate into the mineralized tissue making them visible for later observation now what are the dyes that we can use uh, one of example is alizarin so it is the dye that is that is very effective for the vital staining so it remain within the bone and teeth allowing the researcher to detect and study the stained area so these are the various dyes alizarin tetracycline tryptophan blue these can be used other step other method is the radio isotope so radio active elements can be injected into the tissue of experimental animal that get incorporated into the bone and the bone gra- uh, growth can be studied through the radio activity that is emitted by these radio isotopes so various uh, radio isotopes Uh, that can be used are te- technetium calcium etc other is implant radiography <coughs> implant radiography it is a technique that is used to study the growth particularly in the human so in implant radiograph uh, inert metal pin typically made of material like titanium they are surgically inserted into the various location within the bony skeleton including the face and jaw so these metal pins they are biocompatible meaning they are not harmful to the body so radiograph images like the cephalograms they can be taken so super imposing the radiograph on implant that will allow for the precise observation of changes in the position of one bone in relation to the other now what are the various site of implantation in the mandible uh they can be symphysis in midline between the roots right body of the mandible 
one below the first premolar another below the first molar in the maxilla they are placed inferior to zygomatic inferior to anterior laser spine bilaterally in the zygomatic process in hard palate behind the canine and the uh, front of first molar injection between the alveolar process and the palate now what are the other methods uh, that can be used apart from the implant radiography there are other methods <coughs> like the natural markers so these include features within the bone like the nutrient canal and trabeculae that can serve as marker for studying growth genetic studies it helps to identify the genetic factors that influence the growth and development in the individual now the growth data now these uh, data can be either direct data indirect data or derived data now how do you collect the data that can be cross sectional studies <coughs> cross sectional studies involves the examining the people of different ages at a single point in time to understand the growth at specific age so they are efficient as they save time and allow for the large sample size whereas the <coughs> whereas the longitudinal studies it means regularly measuring the same individual over a long period of time as they grow so the same individual is is regularly measured over a long time as he grow so this method would understand how individual change over time including the speed variation of their development etc they have a drawback like they are used for smaller sample size and other disadvantage is that it's challenging in maintaining the research facilities and storing the data for such a extended period of the third are the mixed or semi longitudinal studies so they will combine aspect of both the cross sectional as well as the longitudinal approach now let us discuss how can you interpret the growth data now two types of curve they are commonly used the first is the distance curve that is also known as cumulative curve so uh, this distance curve will show the total distance a child has traveled along their growth path so it will provide a cumulative view of growth over time whereas the velocity a curve or that is known as increment curve it reveals the rate at which child grow during a specific time frame so it is created by plotting the changes in the height or the weight from one age point to the next <coughs> provide providing the insight into speed of the growth now let us discuss the various uh, features of growth uh, they can be discussed on basis of the pattern variability and timings the first is the pattern so uh, first of all there is difference in the relative rate of growth between one part of body and the other uh, so different body parts they grow at different rates <clears throat> for example during childhood and adolescence the long bone of the limbs such as the legs and arms they tend 
to exhibit faster growth rate compared to the other part of the body. So that results in increase in height during this period. So different part, uh, different part, different body parts or the organs they grow at different rate. For example, during childhood and adolescent, the long bones of limbs they have a faster growth than the other part that results in increase in the height during this period. <clears throat> so various body uh, body parts go through different growth uh, growth spurts at different times in an individual life. Like the growth of the facial bone and structures, they are more pronounced during the puberty, leading to changes in the shape and proportion of the face. Similarly, growth of reproductive organs, they are, and the secondary sexual characteristics occurs during the adolescent age. So the concept of differential growth uh, means that the timing and the extent of growth in one body part or the organ can differ from other. So this known uniform growth pattern is known as differential growth. Now the differential growth in human it is reflected uh, <coughs> in cephalocaudal gradient of growth and scammon curve. So what are those? Uh, cephalocaudal uh, gradient of growth. So that refers to different in the rate of growth between the different part of the body. So as the humans grow from fetal life to the adult, <clears throat> their overall body proportion changes. So an important concept in this context is that presence of axis of increased growth that extends from head down to the feet. <clears throat> So this axis of increased growth, it is known as cephalocaudal gradient of the growth. Remember, in the early stage of fetal life, around the third month, around the second or third month of the <coughs> intrauterine life, the head constitute around the 50% of the total body length. At this, uh, at this point, the cranium that is the skull. This skull it is relative large compared to the face and makes up more than half of the head. Whereas the limbs they are underdeveloped and the trunk it is relatively small in the proportion. At the time of the birth The trunk and limbs they have grown faster compared to the head and face. The proportion of entire body develops devoted to head uh, decreases to about 30%. The pattern of growth it continues with the progressive reduction in the relative size of the head to about 40% uh, to about 12% in adults. So that means that individual grow when the individual grow and well from the infancy to adulthood his head becomes a smaller proportion of the overall body size so the head it will it will get smaller so this changes in the relative size of the head compared to rest of, uh, of the body it reflects the cephalocaudal gradient of the growth so that means that there is a trend of increased growth extended from the head down to the feet. Additionally, not all system of the body they grow at the same rate. After birth, the muscular and skeletal elements they tend to grow faster than the brain and central nervous system. So this difference in growth rate it is reflected in decrease in the head size compared to the rest of body. The other growth curve, it's the Scammon growth curve. So it is classification that describes the different growth rate of various tissues and organs in the human body during the postnatal period, uh, which spans around 20 years. So there are four distinct curves, uh, each corresponding to specific 
category of the body tissue and their growth patterns they are the uh, lymphoid curve neural curve general and genital curve so these are the four curve the first is the lymphoid curve uh, lymphoid curves includes the tissues like the thymus pharyngeal and tonsillar adenoids and interstitial lymphatic masses it shows that these lymphoid tissue uh, other are the neural curves remember the uh, lymphoid curve these lymphoid tissue reaches 200% of their adult size between age of 10 to 15 years then they reduce from 200% to 100% of adult size in adulthood through process that is known as physiological involution <clears throat> second are the neural curve they include uh, tissues like brain spinal cord bony part of skull upper face and vertebra remember by the age of 8 years these neural tissue are 90% of their adult size the third are the general curve that includes uh, the somatic tissues like the musculature bony skeleton respiratory and digestive organs so these curves will show s s type s shape growth pattern the steady growth it occurs from birth to 5 years so there is a little change from 5 to 10 years <clears throat> growth accelerate during the puberty and slow downs in the adulthood the last is the genital curve the genital curve <clears throat> it curves it curves this curve relates to the primary sex apparatus and all the secondary sexual characteristic so it shows a small rise in the first year of life becomes torment around the age of 10 and then experience rapid acceleration during the adolescence the neural tissue that includes the brain spinal cord uh, uh, we know that the neural tissue so at the age of 6 years they are 90% of their growth and reach 96% by the by the age of the 10 the lymphoid tissue they reach up to maximum at the age of 7 years so they continue to proliferate beyond this point and after that they shrink after the puberty the somatic tissue that includes the muscle bony skeleton and various organs so they form a s shaped s shaped growth curve so they exhibit steady growth from birth to age 5 then there are minimal changes from age 5 to 10 and there is acceleration during the puberty and slowing down of the growth in the adulthood the last are the genital tissue they include the primary sex organs like the ovaries testes and secondary sexual characteristic like uh, that accelerate rapidly around the time of the puberty now uh, second is the variability so uh, second pattern is a basic feature of growth include the variability well no two individual exhibit same type of growth pattern at particular age factors contributing to the growth variability they are the hereditary sex nutrition exercise climate etc the girls they typically reach their maximum length earlier than the boys the timing the timing of growth events can vary among the individual timing it is influenced by the factors like the sex with girls typically entering the puberty earlier than the boys 
so understanding the timing of the growth it is important when planning growth modification growth rhythm so let us discuss about the growth rhythm and the growth spurts <coughs> well the growth it is not constant but it occurs it occurs in period of rapid acceleration followed by relative quiescence the rapid increase in growth rate it is known as the growth spurt <coughs> growth spurt may occur at different times in boy in the boys and the girls the girls experience growth spurts approximately 2 years ahead of the boys so the first growth spurt it is seen just before the birth then one year after the birth then it is seen in the mixed dentition in boys in the girls it appears earlier at age of 7 to 9 years whereas in the boys it is seen in 8 to 11 years other are the pup pubertal growth spurts the, uh, in girls they are seen uh, that are adolescent growth spurts in girls they are seen at the age of 11 to 13 years and in boys it is seen in the age of 14 to 16 years now the growth spurts they have a significant a role in the orthodontics orthopedics and the functional appliances they are most effective during the adolescent growth spurt so growth spurt will determine the predictability growth direction patient management and total treatment time so they will act and serve as indicator for timing orthodontic and orthopedic treatment now there are few terminologies with respect to the growth let us discuss them uh, first of all you should know what is growth field well the growth field they are the areas on the outer and the inner surface of bone that are covered by the soft tissues uh cartilage or membranes so these growth fields they are spread over all the bone like a mosaic and they are responsible for changing the bone during the growth other are the growth site well the growth site they are special areas within the growth field uh, that are important for the growth of specific bone for example the mandibular condyle in the mandible or the maxillary tuberosity in the maxilla the third are the growth centers growth centers they are the specific growth sites that have a significant role in contributing the overall growth of the bone like epiphyseal plate in a long bone so like unlike the growth site growth center they are believed to have their own inherent growth potential other is the remodeling the remodeling it is a process involving the differential growth activities like the addition and removal of the bone tissues on the inner and the outer surface so this process can lead to changes in the bone structures like the posterior movement of the ramus achieved through combination of the bone loss and bone gain so this positive indicates the bone gain and minus sign indicates the bone loss so the bone cortex they experience two fundamental process one is the deposition and other is the resorption the deposition means deposition is addition of new bone that means the <coughs> addition of new bone material while resorption uh resorption is the is a uh, removal of the existing bone material well the depository surface the faces the direction of the uh, the, the depository surface will face the direction of the growth and the resorptive surface it face away from the direction of the growth 
so if the rate of deposition and the rate of resorption they are roughly equal the thickness of cortical bone it remains constant so that means that bone will maintain its size and shape when these two procedures they are balanced so when the deposition it will exceed the resorption the overall the overall size and cortical dimension it gradually increases so that means that bone uh, more bone material it is added than removed that results in the bone growth <clears throat> so during the bone during the growth the bone it changes its shape and size to accommodate the development of different regions so in the mandible the posterior part of bone it moves backward while the anterior part it gets longer so this process it is known as a relocation and it involves a combination of the bone deposition and the resorption as the mandible ramus ramus it moves backward the anterior part of bone transforms into a new section for the mandibular corpus that results in the elongation of the corpus the corpus refer to the horizontal body of the mandible so the mandible it consists of several parts and corpus it is the main horizontal flat portion of the lower jaw bone that hold the lower teeth so the entire ramus it is shifted to posterior and the posterior part of the lengthening corpus it occupies the space occupied by the ramus so this transformation of what was once the part of ramus into a new part of the corpus it is form of structural remodeling that leads to elongation of the corpus now what are the ways where which the growth movement can occur <clears throat> there can be cortical drift uh, the cortical drift it is a type of growth movement that involves the shifting of bone tissue toward the depository surface so this movement occur due to the combi combination of the resorption on the one surface and a deposition on the opposing surface so that would help to reshape and reposition the bone the other method is the displacement displacement means the movement of the whole bone as a unit <clears throat> it can be either primary displacement the, the primary displacement means the displacement that is related to bones own enlargement or growth so it's like a bone self movement imagine a bone in upper jaw that is the maxilla that needs to grow upward and backward so as it do the entire bones it moves uh, entire bone it moves forward and downward creating a space for itself to grow so the mouth it moves the forward and downward it is exactly the same as the mouth it grows in the opposite direction so it is like a bone that is pushing its way into the new areas to make room for its own growth the primary displacement of the maxilla in the forward direction occurs due to the growth of the maxillary tuberosity that grows back posteriorly it creates a space behind it so in response to this primary displacement the entire maxilla it moves forward to occupy this space so in other words the growth of maxillary tuberosity triggers a forward movement of the maxilla itself so this dynamic relation between the growth and displacement helps to shape the facial structure uh, that creates and maintain the position with respect to other cranial with the respect to other craniofacial structures the other is the secondary displacement 
the scandi displacement is like it is like the like the bone is op- responding to the external forces it is not about the bone pushing itself around but rather being carried by some outer physical forces so in the scandi displacement the bone moves in response to factor other than its own growth that could be due to the external pressure or changes in the surrounding tissue the example of scandi uh, in the scandi displacement a bone movement it is not directly related to its own growth instead it is influenced by the growth of other bones and their surrounding tissues so that can create a domino effect so where changes in one region of face affect the other areas even if they are at quite distant position example is when the middle cranial fossa and the temporal lobe of the cerebrum they grow forward they can indirectly displace the entire naso maxillary complex anteriorly and inferiorly so this this it is result of the pro, it of it is result of both the primary and secondary movements that are occurring simultaneously other is the remodeling that involves the deposition of the new bone we have already discussed the remodeling process so suppose there are two balloons so example two balloons they are touching each other when one balloon expand it can either push the other balloon away or the balloons they can be pulled apart by the external forces creating space for other so in first scenario the expansion of one balloon it pushes the other that leads to the separation so that means the pushing force displacement is the primary movement and the second balloon adjusts to this displacement in the second scenario the external forces they pull the balloon apart and both balloon respond by expanding into the space being created so here the primary movement it is the combined enlargement of the both balloons and their and their growth follows almost simultaneously the sep, uh, the separation that is the displacement now relating this to the facial growth consider the mandible growing towards its contact with the cranial bone in this case the displacement occur causing the entire mandible to move away from the cranial bone as it enlarges the question is whether the uh, whether the primary movement is the displacement or or the remodeling enlargement now relate this to balloon analogy so imagine two balloons in contact when one balloon expand it can either push the other balloon away or be pulled apart by the external forces so in the craniofacial context the first scenario would be condylar growth pushing the mandible away displacement here is scandi the sc- uh, the second scenario would be the external forces pulling the mandible apart so the displacement here is primary and the mandible respond by growing to maintain the contact with the cranial now let us discuss the characteristic of the bone formation the bone formation it can occurs by the two methods one is the intramembranous ossification and other is the endochondral ossification the endochondral ossification it is the one of the main process by which bone in the human body develops the other is the intramembranous ossification the intramembranous ossification it is responsible for formation of most of the long bones in the body including including uh, the bones in the limbs now let us discuss the endochondral ossification uh, the endochondral ossification Uh, that begins with the cartilage model formation so the process begins with the cartilage model in early stage of fetal development a template of future bone it is formed from the hyaline cartilage so this cartilage model resembles the shape of future bone and it provides a scaffold for the bone formation around the cartilage model 
there will be formation of perichondrial membrane. So a thin layer of connective tissue known as perichondrium it forms. It contains cells that will play a role in the bone formation. So in the midsection of cartilage model what you will see chondrocytes. Chondrocytes they are the remember chondrocytes they are the cartilage forming cells that enlarges and then die. So this enlargement and death of chondrocytes trigger the surrounding perichondrial cells to transform into osteoblast which are the which are the bone forming cells. So this region is known as primary ossification center. The osteoblast they will produce bone matrix uh, including the collagen and the mineral around the perichondrium. So this collar will provide structural support and strengthen the developing bone. Apart from that vascular blood vessels and the capillary penetrates the collar of bone bringing the oxygen and nutrients that are essential for the bone growth. As primary ossification center it continue to grow toward the end of bone secondary ossification center they develop within the epiphysis end of the bone. So the chondrocytes in the epiphyseal region the primary and the secondary ossification center, they are continue to divide, adding more cartilage. So there will be continuous deposition of bone replacing the cartilage. So the bone here replaces the cartilage throughout the childhood and the adolescent. So when the growth is complete, the epiphyseal plate, it closes and remaining cartilage, it, it is replaced by the bone. So this is the endochondrial ossification model. The other is the intramembranous ossification. The intramembranous ossification, it is responsible for flat bones of skull. So the process begins with the group of undifferentiated mesenchymal cells. So mesenchymal cells, they are type of stem cells that can develop into various cell types. So these cells will condense in specific area where bone will form. Under the specific signaling molecules and genetic factors, some of the mesenchymal cells, they differentiate into osteoblast. So osteoblast are the bone forming cells, they begin to produce uh, organic extracellular matrix called the osteoid. As osteoblast continue to lay down the osteoid, calcium and other minerals, they start to accumulate within the matrix. So these minerals forms the hydroxyapatite crystals which give bone their hardness. Now what is the key difference between these two types of ossification? The intramembranous ossification involves the direct transformation of the mesenchymal connective tissue into the bone. So there is no cartilage precursor. Whereas the endochondral ossification, it begins with a hyaline cartilage model that serve as a template for the bone formation. The cartilage, it is gradually replaced by the bone. Uh, in the intramembranous ossification that primarily effect forms the flat bones of the skull such as bone of skull, facial bone and some clavicle bones whereas the endochondral ossification it is responsible for forming the majority of bone in the body including the long bones, short bones and irregular bones. Now coming to the coming to the various growth hypotheses remember uh, the year and the hypothesis that were given. In 1930 the remodeling theory was given by Brash, the suture Theory was given by Sitcher, the nasal septum theory was given by Scott, functional matrix theory was given by Moss, servo system theory was given by Petrovic and uh, remember all these theories and the year, especially for your entrance exam point of view. Who proposed the sutural dominance theory? It was by Sitcher. Who gave the nasal septum theory? It was given by Scott. The functional matrix theory was given by Moss and servo system was given by Petrovic. 
So remember all these theory. The first is the genetic theory. Genetic theory it was given by Brody. And the sutural theory was given by the Sutcher. The genetic theory, the Brody theory postulated that the skull growth was primarily controlled by the genetic factors. So the genes determine the overall growth control. According to Brody, the genetic factors were considered the primary determinants of the craniofacial growth. The sutural theory was given by Sitchell. He believes that the craniofacial growth it occurs at the sutures. So, according to Sitcher, each suture was believed to contain genetic information that determine the amount of growth occurring at the specific sutures. The sutures respond to the mild tension forces and surface deposition of the bone that allow for bone that allow the bones of face and skull to adapt. So when the forces are exerted on the sutures, such as those generated during the chewing or other functional activity, sutures can deposit new bone on the surface facing the direction of applied forces. Other theory was the cartilaginous theory. It was given by the Scott. He believed that the intrinsic growth factors, intrinsic growth controlling factors, they are present in the cartilage and the periosteum that play important role in the craniofacial growth. According to this theory, the nasal septum, it is the primary mechanism responsible for growth of the nasomaxillary complex that includes the growth of the upper jaw and associated structures. So as the nasal septum it grows and develop, it exert growth related forces on the surrounding craniofacial bone. The other is the functional matrix theory. It was given by the Melvin Moss. So the Moss was influenced by the idea of Van der Klaus. So who asserted that the skull it is made up of units whose size, shape, and position were determined by their function. So according to this hypothesis, the skull it is not a single homogeneous structure, but it contains a collection of functional unit. So these functional units are specialized region of the craniofacial complex and they are associated with specific functions. So the functional matrix theory, it seeks to explore how the form of th that is the shape, size and the position of these functional unit, it is linked to their functions. So most theory stated that the craniofacial complex evolves and adapts in response to the functional requirement. Like the development of the specific facial structures, it is influenced by functions such as mastication, speech and the respiration. The functional unit, the functional cranial component, uh, they can be either skeleton unit or the functional matrix. The skeleton unit consists of microskeleton and macroskeleton units. The microskeleton units are alveolar, gonial, condylar, angular, and base unit of the mandible, whereas the macroskeleton units they are the mandible and the maxilla. The functional matrix it is composed of uh, capsular matrix or the periosteal matrix. Uh, the periosteal matrix consists of muscles, tendons, nerves, blood vessels, and glands. Uh, they act on the macroskeleton unit and causes change in the shape and size by the apoposition and resorption. Whereas the capsular matrix, the example are the neurocranial capsule or orofacial capsule. They will act indirectly on the macroskeleton units causing expansion of capsule and causes passive growth. So the Melvin Moss, he introduced the functional matrix hypothesis uh, stating that the craniofacial bones uh, he just grow. He challenged the idea that the craniofacial bone just grow. Instead, he proposed that the head it is complex structure composed of different functional components each serving specific function. Uh, so these functions are carried out by soft tissue which are supported and protected by the related bones. 
He also introduced the concept of transformation and translation. Some growth occurred directly due to the functional matrix like the muscles while the other growth, growth it is secondary and compensatory. Now what are the clinical application of the functional matrix theory? The orthodontic appliances like braces can alter the periosteal matrix which, respond, uh, which consists of the teeth. So by applying forces to reposition teeth changes occur in the microskeleton unit including the including the alveolar bone. Alteration of the capsular matrix, dentofacial orthopedics involves the treatment that can change the capsular matrix that relates to the jaw. So this treatment leads to changes in the macroskeleton unit, impacting the position and growth of the jaw. The rapid palatal expansion technique aims to expand the upper jaw by altering the capsular matrix. It is used to correct the tissues like the narrow palate. Cleft palate patient offers require reposition of the maxillary segment to address the facial deformity. So this reposition would affect the capsular matrix. The anterior bite plane can be used to correct the deep bite by influencing the periosteal matrix and guiding the eruption and position of the teeth. The activator stimulates the condyle growth. The activator is an orthodontic appliance that stimulates the growth in the condyle. Uh, it influences both the periosteal and the capsular matrix. The Frankel functional regulator use lip, pad, lip pads and buccal shield has impact on both the periosteal and the capsular matrix. It can affect the development of jaws and the oral structure. Inter arch elastics, headgear, face masks, chin cups, they have a direct effect on the functional matrix by altering the muscular behavior and spaces within the oral cavity. The other theory is the servo system. It was given by Petrovic. So this theory is based on cybernetic concept. So that involves the study of system of any kind that can receive, store or process information for the purpose of control. The cybernetics, it is the study of system that have ability to gather, store and process information to, to control themselves or other system. So it suggested that the craniofacial growth it is not solely determined by the genetics but involves a feedback mechanism where the system responds to various type of input and adjust its growth accordingly. It's just like a, how to, a thermostat in a room, it controls the temperature based upon the input it receives maintaining a desired set point. Other is neurotropism. Uh, most functional matrix theory suggests that the soft tissue like the muscle gland and the other structures, they have a significant effect on the growth and development. Neurotropism, it is a concept that is related to interaction between the nerves and the tissue. It is a known impulse transmitting neural function that involves the transport of the materials within the nerve cells. Neurotropism facilitate long term interaction between the neurons and the tissue they innervate. So three types of uh, neurotropic mechanism that can be seen, uh, neuroepitheliotropism, that relates to the growth and regeneration of the epithelial tissue, uh, neuromuscular tropism, etc. Other is the trajectory, trajectory theory of bone formation that was given by Mayer. So Mayer, he proposed how bone adapt and responds to the functional stresses. Mature bone including the jaw bone, it is composed of two main types that is compact bone and the cancellous bone. Cancellous bone, it has a meshwork of trabecule that creates a structural pattern. Within these pattern, there are interconnected medullary pattern. The trajectoral theory uh, state that the orientation of trabeculae corresponds to pathway of the maximum pressure and tension 
in an area with the greater stress the trabeculae they are thicker so these thicker trabeculae are referred as trajectories that indicates the maximum stress within the bone so most trajectories in the bone they cross at the right angle uh, so the natural line of stress in the skull they were studied by benning hof he pierced small holes in the fresh skulls and observed that these holes they form a linear pattern when the skull were dried so these these linear patterns were uh, stated as benning hof lines or trajectories that indicates the direction of the functional stresses in the bone the maxilla we know it's less compact and more porous than the mandible so it provides a maximum strength with minimum bone material due to these trajectories the trajectories in the maxilla include both the vertical and the horizontal direction that includes the fronto nasal uh, buttresses malar zygomatic buttress and pterygoid buttress minor trajectories are produced due to the muscle attachment uh, they are observed in region like symphysis and gonial angle the wolf law it was produced uh, it was proposed by the wolf he explained the arrangement of trabecular pattern in the bone and attributes it to the functional stress the change in the magnitude of force can lead to change in the internal structure and shape of the bone so increase in the function result in increase bone density and thicker trabeculae whereas the lack of function leads to decrease trabeculae density so these concept highlights how the bone they respond to stress